Good afternoon, everybody. This is Robin Ayub from the Localization Fireside Chat, and welcome to episode number 59. And in today's episode, I'm honored to be joined by Don De Palma from CSA Research. And uh, Don, thank you for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming online with me. Um, this episode is full of topics that I've uh, been, you know, going over in my mind before we started, before we got started in this conversation that I can't wait to tackle with you. But as we say on this channel, Don, uh, you're a well-known figure. Everybody knows you. I've known you since I started in the business. I think you were like three, four years into CSA research when I started uh, 20 years ago. Uh, I know you've been, uh, I just saw on your profile, you just celebrated 25 years uh, with CSA research. You're one of the original founders, you're chief strategist for the, for the organization. You've started the research industry in the localization industry. So you're the reason that other research uh, companies have... Um, you know, sprouted from the uh, from the uh, from the localization industry. You set the bar, uh, which is great for um, this industry. Needs more and more research, I would I believe, and we'll talk a little bit about that one. Like everybody says on this channel, I have a um, I have two theories for how people got into the business by accident or on purpose. Uh, so uh, everybody's dying to hear it. Tell me your story. How did you get into localization? I'm sure someone before has said accidentally on purpose. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, I was at, uh, at Forrester Research in the, the 90s, uh, working on enterprise class software uh, applications, researching that area, analyzing it, which included database transaction processing, uh, a lot of fun technologies that, that drive business. Uh, during that, I, I started working with a colleague on sizing the internet in 1995. Uh, believe it or not, that was a, a, a concept back then. Would it be something? And uh, just the year before, the Mozilla browser had come into being. Uh, so we said, well, how big is this going to be? And we said, well, it's going to be really big. And in the course of that really bigness, I started looking at, well, if this also means that it's going to be not just English, it's going to be global. And so I started a stream of research on uh, what the Internet would be doing to uh, the software industry. The first report on that was called Software Sans Frontiers which caused a problem in the publishing system uh, at the time because it didn't have diacritical marks. Uh, so you can imagine a, a bit of difficulty. Went on to write another report on global websites at the time interviewing uh, some of the companies that are still around, including Linebridge and uh, uh, some others that uh, 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 in various forms in the industry. And then as I proceeded with that, I decided this was something really uh, interesting. Left Forrester, uh, took a, a short uh, job with, uh, as a director of strategy at, at Idiom. And at that point said, I, I really like research more than I like uh, uh, software development, which is where uh, I had been previously working on, uh, actually on, on software before I went to Forrester. Uh, go back even further than that. And uh, the other part of this accident was that I was a Slavicist uh, in academia. Uh, dealing with really fun topics, uh, uh, historical phonology, and then uh, generative and computational linguistics uh, back when uh, we were working on mainframes. And that's really where the bug bit me. Uh, this integration of, of language and uh, technology has just defined my career over the last, uh, well, too many years now. So um, now that you're uh, 25 years in uh, CSA research, for those who don't know CSA research, and some of my audience are not part of the localization industries, are, are probably on the outside look, looking in, uh, could you give us a little bit of a uh, sort of a schematic? What is CSA research? Departments, specialties, uh, you know, whatever you feel like describing the company would be great. Um we're a market research firm in the model of uh, uh, mainstream companies like IDC, Gartner, and, and Forrester. Uh, that's my heritage in this space. What I did when I looked at the language sector uh, first uh, in those uh, days of 1997, 98, when I started uh, doing some research in, in the sector, I saw that this was a, a nascent kind of industry. Uh, a lot was happening. Technology was coming into play. It was a reality of, uh, you know, the internet at the time, but uh, it was still pretty much a cottage industry with a couple of exceptions. 
Uh, it was Berlitz and uh, Bound at the time, and those have gotten absorbed in various ways. And I, I looked at this and said, uh, you know, this, this industry needs uh, some sort of uh, uh, way of, of looking at it in a, a structured fashion that said, this is actually a business. It's not a collection of a bunch of linguists and small companies, but instead something that was serving a very real business. And so what I did then was said, okay, how do we apply the methodologies uh, that these uh, companies in the mainstream use to show that a company comes in, it has a value proposition, uh, it can sell that to that value proposition, it makes enough money to succeed, and mm -hmm. it's, it's doing good along the way in, in the area where it's supposed to be doing good. And also, uh, in the case of the language sector, it also brings a lot of people in via inclusion uh, that otherwise would be left outside. So uh, we write research qualitative and quantitative. I mean, some of you on this uh, podcast, listening to this podcast, may have been interviewed by us or surveyed by us. And uh, I'll have to apologize for the surveys. We started the language market sizing survey uh, many years ago. I think we're into our 19th now. And uh, others have decided that's a great thing that they have to do. So every January, it's sort of like uh, the uh, the return of the flamingos or something. Uh, <laughs> three or four surveys to send on you. So sorry about that. But what we do is we take this, uh, we collect a representative sample across the market. We validate the data. We make sure that everything is in there. We follow all of the proper statistical procedures. We size the market. Uh, before we do that, we validate the data with all the companies so it's this process here. It's all about process uh, that is followed in other industries. And that was, I was intent on bringing that to the language sector when I came in. So what is your, uh, and we'll dig into it, like uh, just if you don't mind, like high level stuff, the size of the industry in the, in the Americas or the size of the industry global, what's the sense of 2024 uh, in terms of market size? How much is worth now, like in terms of revenue for the localization industry globally? Uh, do you have a sense of that? And B, I hear the number 19,000 companies in the localization industry, actually 18 and a fraction, I guess, 18,600. I don't know. I don't remember the exact number, but it's close to 19,000 uh, companies in the localization industry. I got that from the, one of the CSA research reports. Is that true? Um, and B, now when you get those surveys results back, and I know you come from a research, industry, from a research uh, background, what is your confidence level that the information, it is not being used for marketing purposes by whoever fills it out and it's reflective truly of what they are? Because most of the industry that we're in, they're not publicly traded companies. Publicly traded companies are, you know, they have to follow certain uh, publicly traded company rules and regulations of information sharing. But when you're a private sector company, there's no rules or regulations on that one. Yeah, that's a great question. And it, it's one that we, we face every year. We send out the data, we get it back. Uh, we have a, a, a strict process. Uh, it's basically, it's, it's all data science uh, at that level is something within bounds. Uh, so we right away look for outliers. That's a pretty easy thing to do. If a company has three employees, but uh, $9 million in revenue, uh, you say something is, is wrong or they're in uh, Bitcoin, you know, uh, so, uh, so we've got those kinds of things. But then what we really do is spend most of our time once we get past the obvious kinds of things. And you look at a company that is you know, 10 employees and dealing with uh, a certain set of, uh, whether it's interpreting or translation, or we actually look at six category, large categories, uh, translation, localization, interpreting, uh, uh, translation technologies, and services like multimedia, uh, support services and content services or business service supporting services. So, and then multiple categories under those. Uh, so we look at that, do the smell test, uh, throw out the ones that don't look good. If it's close, but there's an error, we'll go back and ask. But then on the companies that we uh, list in our top 100, uh, and then we go beyond that to the regional companies, we also go back to each company individually with a validation survey. It starts about two weeks after we open the general survey. So we annoy the people again with another survey saying, you told us this, and uh, did you really mean that you had this many employees and uh, you're uh, doing this much revenue in here in this, this sector? Uh, and just go through everything. And then they sign it at the end. 
Uh, at that point, you know, we have to rely to a certain level on trust. Uh, but at that point, we've we've also gotten to the uh, the issue of outliers have been removed. We've asked them specifically if there's any questions. And um, so to that extent, the companies that appear year after year on the list, you can have a high level of confidence. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they are what they are. Uh, every now and then there's a company which is, you know, flips up into the marketplace. Uh, either it's they've had a really great year and they show up but previously they hadn't. We look at those kinds of things as well. So we spend an awful lot of time on, on data. Cleansing and, the data? Uh, yeah. Sanitizing uh, data, the data, yeah. Data cleansing is an important issue. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so based on this one, uh, Don, what is your read for 2024 in terms of the, you know, size of the industry, like where we are right now in uh, the third week of March uh, of 2024? What do you think the size of the industry is at? Well, ac across those six sectors that I mentioned, translation, localization, interpreting, like it's going to be around a $54 billion market. Uh, translation and localization makes up the lion's share of that, no pun intended. Uh, and the uh, the balance of that is spread among the, the other categories. Now, that's a, 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 an increase over uh, last year. There had been a drop uh, last year from the previous year. So as, as everyone knows, it was this uh, plague year that we had in 2020 uh, mm -hmm. that just threw everything off. So the traditional growth of the industry up to that point had been uh, uh, pretty solid, you know, five, six, seven percent. And then it just uh, hit a trough because the world shut down, everything to turn to guacamole. And then uh, the next year we had a, a jump up. And then uh, as we saw at the beginning of 2023, if you remember the, uh, the spate of uh, layoffs and other activity yeah. that was happening, uh, there was this uh, uh, second year of uh, 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 the geopolitical conflict we, mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, was a surprise, you know, uh, going back to the 1975 Helsinki Accords, we thought all of that was over with, but that's another discussion. And then, uh, so there were a number of forces in 2022, second half of 2022, going into 2023, that depressed the market. Mm -hmm. And that was, um, uh, essentially, we, we said that uh, the business services were put on hold as you're laying off 10,000 people, and, and importantly here, the tech sector, uh, Silicon Valley uh, in, this, in the US, the German equivalents, other equivalents around the world, they were just throwing off people, uh, cutting costs, uh, travel had stopped, uh, things weren't looking good. And so the last thing they're gonna do is spend, uh, let's say discretionary funds on additional language uh, work. So. What we had was that that drop, so it took a little bit off uh, the market. It was a little less than a percent, but still it was a drop. And uh, that's the thing that we're we're looking at. That was uh, we were counter uh, cyclical in in that respect. We had expected that increase to continue. So what we do now is, and we just published uh, last month uh, a forecast for the year with that fifty four uh, billion dollar number. And what we do as part of our methodology is not just pick a number out of a hat and say, oh, this is what it is, and it's going to grow continuously at this rate. Instead, we take external factors as well. We, uh, for example, look at the International Monetary Fund that has a quarterly report uh, on the economy and, well, the economies of the world. And what we do with that is we uh, have a formula where we take a percentage of the annual number, uh, actually, we we create, we have a, a formula that says the advanced economies of the world, the U.S., uh, Western Europe, Northern Europe, uh, Asian, uh, you know, Asian countries, uh, those are the ones that uh, account for a certain percentage of growth in the market because they're a vast amount of, of the world's turnover. And then the other 20% is the developing economies. And so the, the model takes all of that into account. And on a quarterly basis, what we've decided to do now is instead of waiting for these major uh, factors to, to take effect, what we say is, okay, quarterly, we're going to put out this report and say what the, the zeitgeist of the economists uh, is at that point. Yeah, I'm, I'm very encouraged to hear you say growth in 2024, because 
on this channel, we talk a lot about AI and the, uh, there's two thoughts on, on AI. There's the positive uh, thinking that says AI is going to create opportunities in the business. And of course, there are uh, those uh, thoughts that says, uh, no, it's going to impact my business, going to chew away my revenue, uh, etc. But when you are forecasting growth in 2024 for the industry, with all what's going on in the AI world and the impact of the new technology on the business. And we'll talk a little bit in here. I've got my couple of questions on this topic here with you. So am I reading you correctly by saying AI is going to create growth in the business uh, or we're not there yet in terms of the huge impact that AI may cause in 2024, but we may see it down the road in a few years. Well, AI is a, a friend and a foe to the industry. Uh, <clears throat> what we hear, I, uh, regularly is that uh, AI is, uh, especially last year, this concern about uh, AI uh, taking over, uh, for example, tr uh, from automated translation or taking over translation in general. Uh, so some companies just uh, pulled back on the, the throttle. Others uh, went so far as to uh, uh, eradicate their internal teams and cut spending. So a lot of stuff happened. But on the other hand, you have to look at the, the momentum of what's going on. Companies have obligations. Well, not only companies, but governments, multilaterals. Uh, they have people they want to communicate to. And their goal is to make sure that the communication is correct, that it's authentic, uh, that it meets the requirements. Because at the end of that pipe, a communications pipe, uh, there's a person. And that person has needs, requirements, wants. Uh, depending on what sector they're in, they want to buy something or they need some information from their government, whatever the issue is, it has to be communicated to them in a, a, a solid, understandable, legible, whatever form you're using, whatever mode uh, kind of way so they can act on it. And that's, that's really the core of this industry. And it's what a lot of people forget, that there's people at both ends. There's people creating things and people consuming things. And the machine can take you so far. Machine can help great, uh, greatly with certain kinds of optimizations. But where humans come in, I, uh, it's, we've been writing about this for a long time, is that uh, the humans are the arbiters of, of what ultimately goes out. If there's no human at the core of the operation, no human overseeing it, there's going to be a lot of errors. At some point, will we get to artificial general intelligence and there's no need for humans? At that point, you know, we're in the Terminator matrix uh, part of the this sci-fi story and you know, everything changes. But until then, there's a, a need for humans. And that's why we, uh, why we see uh, that kind of growth continuing. Not hand over fist uh, kind of, of growth, but still growth. And uh, 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 there's a couple other things that we can add, but I'll, I'll let you get to your next question. Yeah, no, I mean, it, this is a very good point, though, um, because the notion out there, rightly or wrongly, um, and not this is not coming from the localization industry, probably from the consumer, as you mentioned earlier, you know, the end user who's paying for, for things to be translated or to be transformed into uh, another language, content to be transformed into another language. There is that anxiety, or I want to call it that itch, if you will, to speed up the process, to lower the cost, to be a more efficient, because there's somebody else, not just the person who's creating the content, maybe you know, whoever responsible for their overall strategy for those businesses, for those markets to say, you know, I want this piece of content to hit the market right away. I want it in the targeted languages. I should not have waited, you know, a month for it to be translated, speed up the process, lower the cost, give me better quality. Those are three factors that keeps popping up everywhere. And everybody thought in from my conversation, with people, you know, and I have to educate always, always other speaking one on one with, you know, uh, industry uh, individual or outside the industry is it's not the Swiss army knife that we were expecting uh, yet. Uh, however, it's a lot of, there's a lot of promises inside of that technology that I have not yet seen or seen before. And we'll talk a little bit about technologies that were created in the eighties. This technology is a little different. Uh, it has the potential to learn, to adapt and to get better. But at this stage where we are right now, it is not, I don't believe it's going to give us that hundred percent hands off, Give it to the machine, and the machine will take care of everything. Uh, I we we agree, and um, you know, back in 2020, we restarted our business confidence survey on a quarterly basis that we had uh, been uh, done early in this century, 
And uh, what we found over the course of the last few years is this shifting uh, paradigm of how work is being done. Initially, it was a lot of work that was, uh, we'll call it human centric. Uh, what has happened over the last few years is this increasing move towards uh, the hybrid uh, human plus machine model. And then there's uh, an increasing amount of automate, fully automated uh, work going on as well. So that's part of the, this idea of the move towards post-localization is that the purely human centric kinds of activity are being replaced by hybrids where the humans are working with the machines. And in fact, we characterize it as being augmented. Uh, pick your favorite uh, metaphor. I always go to the $6 million man, uh, but there's also Tony Stark as Iron Man. Right. <laughs> you, know, you get these cyborg implants or uh, exoshells and you can do a lot more. And that's the analogy for what happens with a, a translator or an interpreter. They can do it better, they're stronger, they're faster, they can do more. So that addresses the, the turnaround time, the productivity. Uh, there's quality estimation technologies coming in. My colleague, uh, Arla Lamel uh, uh, worked at uh, DFKI for a while, putting together the MQM. That's come into its, its own here with many companies building quality estimation technologies on top That's of right. that. That's right. So that you can say at a certain point, this is not just good enough because I looked at the MT and the last time I looked at MT, it sort of kind of smelled like uh, English or whatever language I was translating it into. But you can palpably, uh, you know, look at this and say, yes, uh, this meets all of the requirements and it doesn't have to go off to Robin or Don. Uh, but for the stuff that doesn't, that doesn't hit that, uh, that metric or KPI level, it gets shunted off to that person. And uh, it's a short little uh, excursion, but still you can get it in there in that, uh, that period sure. you want. And with a human employed at that level, not sweeping up, we, we call uh, uh, frequently referred to MT as, as janitorial work after uh, an MT, bad MT outcome. And that's human in the loop, you know, that poor guy's at the end of the loop cleaning up afterwards. Cleaning up. <clears throat> then it's human at the core. When you need a human, that human is there. That human is helping to train it. Uh, they're overseeing it, making sure that it works. And then the, the quality estimation is followed up by quality assessment that says, okay, uh, how well did this do? What's the, what was the engagement level of, of the person consuming the data? Did they buy something? Whatever their metrics are at, at the end of the, the pipeline. So all of that fits into this space um, in, in a way that it opens up a opportunities for humans here not to be, and I, I'm by saying just, not to be just translating or just editing. What they can do is be uh, cultural ambassadors, so to speak. They can be uh, people who know the regulatory structures and know that something isn't going to fit. Uh, so in effect, they become knowledge workers uh, at a level that has some mm -hmm. demonstrable return on investment to the company. Correct. Now, <clears throat> from where you stand, I mean, we've talked a little bit about this topic, but let me let's, let's see if we missed anything on this one. From where you stand, um, in your opinion, and you know, we if, if I ask the question to everybody, everybody's got their own opinion, but you bring a lot more value to it from a research perspective. What are the challenges, do you think, in our sector right now? And you and I talked about AI, not a challenge, I think, it's more of an, an opportunity, but more on the adoption side could be a challenge. What other challenges do you think it's facing us right now as an industry? Well, there's uh, external factors, uh, which I mentioned one of them already. There's uh, a number of conflicts, three major conflicts uh, around the world going on. So that has some impact on, on the markets. Uh, we've had inflation over the last uh, few years. Uh, this has had an impact that we could talk about on the, on the sector in terms of uh, growth. Uh, we uh, have a number of other uh, issues relative to uh, well, something we've written about is uh, just the labor supply. Uh, there's people you need who are tech technical ling linguists and uh, linguistically certified uh, technologists. Mm -hmm. And we're arguably not producing enough of those out of universities. The number of people, uh, who, the number of language programs that have gone away just take a look at the MLA's Modern Language Association's report that came out in November of last year. The number of programs that have just disappeared, it's very difficult to get language education. Uh, the US 
uh, now has, or last year had uh, 212 people studying in China, uh, U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, students, whereas the Chinese had, uh, I think I forgot the exact number, but uh, around 200,000 studying in the United States. So we're not investing, say, in, in some economies as much as we should be in the, the talent. So that's a big issue. Uh, and the people who are in that category of being linguistically savvy technologists may be going to places like uh, uh, business process outsourcing agencies or marketing agencies or uh, software companies instead of going into the language sector. So that labor supply is an issue. Uh, capital is another issue that's uh, we just saw uh, one company go bankrupt this past week. Uh, and so uh, making the creative- Sorry, which one is that? Which one was that? That was Lengu filed for bankruptcy. Okay. Yeah. So uh, what you have is, uh, you know, financial labor, you know, capital issues. Uh, you've got the, uh, uh, for uh, two years, everyone was afraid that a recession was right around the corner. Japan got caught in a recession, the UK uh, as well, uh, you know, I guess trending towards that. So uh, those are issues there from an economic standpoint. Uh, competitiveness, when you look at AI, uh, one of the biggest challenges here is uh, the large language models that do translation. All of a sudden, not well, over the course of the last uh, couple of years, have enabled companies that previously were offering services from a monolingual perspective, let's say a marketing agency or a business process outsourcing company, uh, they, they can now say that, gee, we can offer this in whatever languages the large language model supports. So as they train their models uh, to meet their business requirements, they could uh, do some work there to become much more competitive. Uh, we have universal uh, machine translation around the internet. It's, it's very difficult uh, to not find it. A lot of platforms have it built in, so that's a challenge in itself. So uh, LSPs have to really make the case that they're better than, than those alternatives. Uh, and then uh, intrinsic issues. Uh, just uh, there's a certain inertia in any industry. Yeah, this is the way we've done it. And I don't know right. how, how many times uh, we still see the what, what's your value proposition? We do great translation or we do great interpreting. Uh, you know, that's, that's not enough. That's what, <laughs> you've got 19,000 companies in this, in this industry. They all say the same, right? Yeah. And, uh, so, uh, what this all comes down to is when you look at AI, this is an enabler for, uh, companies in the space to say, okay, how can I take my game to the next level? And that that's next right. level, uh, I'll just put one little thing on this. We have done this thought exercise or experiment, uh, a number of times since uh, I think 2009 is when we first did it with machine translation. How much stuff is created every day? How much content is created every day? And how much of that is translated? And uh, you know, just translated. We're not even talking about interpreting. So what we do for that is there's this uh, resource that IDC uh, uh, has every year called the Global Data Sphere. And they count up from based on their work with all of the storage companies and the networking companies to say, this is how much data has been created. And last year it was 33 uh, to the 10th times something to the 10th to the 18th power. I don't even know what that number is. I always mean to look it up, but it's, as we would say in, in grammar school, it's a gazillion uh, bytes uh, uh, of, of data created every year or every day rather. So what we do is then is we take that number and then we throw out the stuff that's probably not useful, like telemetry data or other stuff, which, you know, you're just not going to translate. We get down to this smaller number and then we say, okay, uh, how much of that, given the amount of that 54 billion uh, is tied to uh, uh, translation? And uh, we say, oh, so 30 billion of that, we do the math. And then we say so many bytes are translated and it comes down to like point zero point eight six seven or something like that. And you know, that's on a daily basis and that's just translation. And it's, uh, doesn't take into account all of the previous days of stuff of being created with that shortfall. 
a lot of this has value, but a lot of it never ever gets leaves the language in which it was created. You want that in Albanian, you're not going to get it. So that's the opportunity. And that's where all of the growth around machine translation and uh, uh, large language models is yep. going to superpower uh, companies that want to do more of that. Of course. Now, let's talk a little bit about the uh, tech. And, um, you know, I couldn't help but noticing that a lot of the technologies that they're still running the industry, that they're still core to our industry in general. And I'm speaking in general, of course, I'm generalizing because and to some fact, it is true, to be honest with you, that a lot of our companies in our industry is still running, you know, the usual TMSs and TMXs and that kind of thing. And those things were built, a technology that was built back in the days, um, in the 90s and uh, 80s, uh, I would say. And so with the evolution and we're looking forward uh, new tech, new, um, a new era of computer software development, the way things are being developed now, can we not, you know, what's, what's your read on the old technology and where that new tech, the old technology, which forms a big part of our localization industry, that technology piece of business, a technology business, where, do, where is it going? Like, is it going to stay on the same bricks that was built on in the eighties or is it going to get adapted, moved to a new platforms, a new way of dealing with these, uh, you know, memories who need, you know, do you still need memories? I, I don't know what you read. Well, that's uh, a, another great question. And one that uh, I, I think can be answered, you know, why they're still doing it that way is uh, what we used to call installed base momentum. Uh, it's just, <laughs> it's, there's so much investment in those technologies that it's really hard to get away from them. And uh, so it's that um, uh, you, you just can't easily exit. But the problem too is where are you gonna exit to? So if you have something like a very large translation management system that's working with you know, 30 languages and nine repositories and you built these connectors and, or bought connectors and done all of this work to make it work with your internal systems, it's a lot to deconstruct that and replace it with anything else. So at, at one level, there's uh, everyone would love to you know wave a, a magic wand, and everything automatically is is transformed into newer technologies. But you've got all of this knowledge, which is uh, built into these systems. A lot of uh, workflows. You've got uh, thing uh, technologies built on standards that are no longer really being supported. We characterize them as being os ossified. Uh, just you know, they're, they're there, they work, and the systems built on them work. Uh, we did a council last year. We have these councils on the LSP side and on the enterprise side. On the enterprise side, uh, we sat in Silicon Valley. The universal uh, 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 plea coming out of that was give us some paradigm-breaking translation management technology. Uh, they want to get away from it, but uh, they need something that they're going to be sure of that can scale it's going to be reliable, that meets all of the, well, my, my classic enterprise requirements are reliability, availability, scalability, <clears throat> and security. You need that for any of these systems because they're, they're running commerce. They're running applications that uh, if they didn't work, companies would go out of business or they'd stop supporting various markets that they want to be in. So what we're starting to see is the roots of some systems that uh, – could replace these, and it won't be a, uh, a question of just taking you know your favorite TMS from 2005 and and rolling it over. There's going to have to be some heavy lifting to move it over. Heavy lifting is first going to be done by the companies building them. So there's uh, you know a, a dozen or so uh, that keep coming up on our radar of translation management systems. Most of yeah. those are going to have to be uh, replaced. Uh, the technology is coming out. AI is certainly helping in some respects. If you look at some of the automation tools out there, uh, like uh, MuleSoft or Blackbird, uh, Blackbird or uh, Zapier or If This Then That, that's kind of the model that people are looking for, where there's an, an automated capability where you get triggers and events that you can say, okay, if this happens, make sure that happens over there. And those are being built on modern technologies. If you look at XML, for example, go back to 
what a lot of these were built on. Yeah, that's just not going to stand up to some of the requirements for flexibility. That's where you're seeing more JSON and, and other technologies coming in. So expect a wholesale conversion to those, but it's not cheap. It was just, I was just talking to an enterprise uh, a couple days ago. It's got a several million dollar conversion effort going on uh, in their TMS. So mm -hmm. it, it's something you're, they're going to have to take the bull by the horns and uh, pay for it. And it's, it won't happen overnight uh, unless somebody comes up with some magic tool. But uh, yeah, I, I, like I, I interviewed uh, on this channel, Don uh, uh, Bruno Bitter from uh, uh, Blackbird, and uh, I was really impressed with uh, the architecture that they have in place and the premises which Blackbird has been developed on. I'm sure I'm just exposed to Blackbird. I'm sure there's many others probably in the same vein. Uh, but from a Blackbird perspective, I really like the uh, uh, the no coding part uh, and the ability to connect with content and ability to connect with platforms on the fly. And before we would require a bunch of programmers sitting in the room trying to code, trying to figure this out. Now it's just a drag and drop into your uh, into your project sheet. And then all of a sudden, as you mentioned earlier, build some triggers around it, which is always also built in. And all of a sudden you have a platform that is customized to a customer use. Because at the end of the day, we tend to be more of an internal focus kind of, a, kind of an industry. At the end of the day, somebody is using our services and we kind of forget that. And, <laughs> and those individuals on the other side who's using our services probably pay, well, most likely, pay for the services, pay for the revenue generated by the industry. And this is the outside in versus the inside out kind of look. So, Right. Well, you know, the one thing that you, you really have to uh, consider with any of these new tools is, uh, like I said, there's the, the scalability issue. So that's something that will be part of the due diligence of any company evaluating these uh, technologies. Yep. Too. Uh, but there's, there's also the, the, let's call it the sustainability. Uh, and this is a, a problem with, any technology. When you step back and you say, yeah, I've been building this thing for 15 years. I have no idea what the heck it does. Uh, and, you know, how can you back out the knowledge from that thing? Uh, and so it's, this is going to be the same problem, especially in the no coding environment, uh, where th what it does is uh, something that is uh, way cool. Uh, but can you reproduce that? Can you figure out what had happened? And so uh, this will be one of the uh, things that we expect to be built into those tools, some audit chains, audit trails, uh, interrogation tools to say, okay, what actually happened here? Especially at some point, you know, without a doubt, something's going to go wrong or off the yep. track. And you want to say, okay, uh, who, what broke where? And that's, yep. that's just something that comes with that. Let's call it the second generation of these products. Uh, so, um, these guys are all smart. The com I've had uh, some... <clears throat> Uh, briefings with companies. Uh, I'm just some, there's some very impressive stuff happening out there. And uh, Excellent. yeah, so uh, there's uh, thing, things will, will get better in that space. So one of the, uh, one of the uh, topics uh, that, you know, it's always been on my mind since we started talking about, you know, chat GPT, uh, artificial intelligence in general, and the widely used tools such as uh, chat GPT and the rest of them. Uh, is the ability to create content in original content in the target language. So one of the biggest question, and I think you and I alluded to that in our prep call, is um, have we entered an era of post-localization? And, you know, just from a general perspective, where do you think this is heading? Yeah, well, the, the idea of post-localization came out of, it's an inflection point, uh, basically. It's we looked at the market, the shift from uh, human being uh, centric to all operations to uh, more of a hybrid mix. And when you chart that out over time with the technologies in place and the processing power that's there, it's an inexorable move. Uh, so when you when you look at it, and actually when we've coined the term, uh, when we started using it last summer, uh, there were some people who say, ah, that's uh, not going to happen or whatever. It's not right. It's because localization isn't going away. They missed the point. It's not localization is going away. Localization is going to get more efficient. There's optimizations, there's capabilities, there's that massive amount of 10 to the 18th power 
uh, kind of content that isn't being touched, not just by translation, but all of the other possible transformations that could happen with that data, uh, with that textual data, and then not even yep. getting into multimedia and others. So that's all the stuff that we're looking in a wave uh, going across the market. So less human involvement in the areas where humans don't add a lot of value. You don't need, uh, for example, as we were talking about, a, a human to like check every bit of content going across when a machine can check a large percentage of that and determine whether you need somebody else to look at it. Project management, all of these things, and increasingly a blend, we'll see a blend of uh, the various modalities. We've been looking mainly at written and spoken language between translation, localization, and interpreting. Well, 99% of the, of the interactions of the communications we have every day are what we're doing right now. We're talking. And when people are talking, you know, information is being created. Uh, that information may have value later on. How do you process that? So this gets into the mode where post-localization starts pulling all of this content of different forms, a multimodal form, mm -hmm. uh, multimodal forms in multimedia, <clears throat> audio, video, spoken, written, and all of those start to share assets. Uh, just think about uh, what you just said about uh, creating content in specific right. languages, directly generating it instead of translating it. Well, what you've got then is this mass of things coming along that have you know some connection at some level, but they don't have shared assets that are driving. Uh, right. For example, you're out just looking at the way OpenAI and the others are building their engines. They're predominantly English. About 55% of the training material out of the digital commons is English. You get another 35, 40% out of the European languages. And so some languages are really good. Some languages are not so good. So what happens is you'll be creating things uh, that ultimately need uh, some remediation, need some level of asset management. So you're using the same terminology, uh, the same glossaries, uh, the same style guides for branding. So the same messages going out. So this is all part of post-localization where there's this blending of assets, blending of data, uh, an attempt to do more than just translate or interpret, but get into some of the other things like extract uh, uh, information from these, summarize, synthesize information, uh, make conversions between written and sp uh, spoken language. So there's a raft of AI-driven kinds of operations that all depend on having enough data and having enough human knowledge applied to that so that we can get to this next level. So, so am I hearing you correctly by, and I'm understanding correctly that we used to be an afterthought kind of an industry for other industries, right? So if you're a pharmaceutical industry or automotive industry, you thought about the localization industry either just before your product hit the market or somewhere. But it sounds like we're now inching closer to where the content is being generated. Am it's, I correct? Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it, as, as you put it, you know, it, the humans were at the, the, uh, at the very end of the process, internationalization, yeah. Uh, might have been earlier on, uh, but when you get to the actual localization, translation, those operations, it was only after the product was was finished uh, and ready to be shipped. Now it's more integral. Uh, so uh, that human at the core element there that it's not the activity of the localization sector is not going to be at the end of the loop or the end of the process, but instead should be more integrally tied uh, throughout the process. And so that means, uh, you know, some obvious things from a, a business perspective is, is having to get in there. There's in-house localization teams, uh, people who own the content, who want things done, who own the processes. Uh, you've mm -hmm. got uh, uh, companies that are global uh, that yep. might outsource it to another unit in, uh, in the company that in turn outsources it to somebody outside. There's a lot of permutations in this. And uh what the, uh, the, the industry has to do is start selling, marketing into those uh, various sectors. And on the business side, on the, the demand side, they're going to be looking at a very broad array of offerings, not only from the traditional BPOs and marketing agencies and others that now claim, oh, we can do it too. That's right. That's right. And I feel like 
the the buying decision has moved from the localization buyer somewhat, not all of it yet, but it's being transformed from the localization buyer, the traditional look buyer to a business decision buyer now. So because the technology allows them to do that. And if you enable the technology, then you distribute the decision making process and who buys it where and when. And you enable a lot more buyers to come on board, I'm assuming. Right. Well, what we're seeing in, in some organizations <clears throat> that are more advanced in this move to post-localization yep. is as they're, they're dealing with global content, uh, they're dealing with global content. They realize that any bit of information has the potential to advance the company's cause in some other market. Yep. So they want to make sure that they, they have some control over that. And uh, so what that means is that it could be anybody. It could it means there's going to have to be uh, somebody in DevOps or content ops or marketing ops or whatever the previous generation of those were called. We've been talking about Lang ops uh, as well as the group inside that coordinates with the groups that are building the applications or building the products and having them documented and importantly supported and marketing and sold uh, in the languages that make sense for those, those particular markets. We're getting into as well uh, multi-dialect kinds of issues as well. So, you know, you just say, okay, OpenAI can do this. Well, can OpenAI do this in the 37 dialects of Spanish or however many there, there are? Uh, I'm sure you can find some LSP that specializes in that. So yep. those are the kinds of opportunities that companies are going to have to be looking forward uh, looking to in, in the future. And, uh, you know, it's you know, the, the one thing we keep coming back to is this isn't just the language sector that's experiencing this right now. Uh, everyone who has an, a knowledge worker kind of job in the world is saying, uh, what is this going to do to my job? Uh, and uh, so that's right. it's a big that's community. Right. And, uh, you know, um, I guess my last question and, uh, um, you know, thinking of, what we've talked about, thinking what you and I've talked about in the previous call and what I know about you for the past 20 years, CSA Research is the older, oldest research company or the more established research company in the language industry. You've, you've started this whole research industry around the localization industry, starting from, you know, you being at Forrester and moving from Forrester, bringing that research um, cadence with you to the uh, language industry. Now we have uh, the one I know about them. I'm sure there are more. Uh, two other uh, market research industries or research uh, in the, uh, companies in, in in the in the industry, Nimsy and Slater. Just for the you know for the person who is, is not familiar with this, how do you characterize the differences from your perspective between those three three companies? Well, this gets into something that I think would be a better discussion over beer. Okay. Uh, and it's a I should have ordered one. <laughs> it's uh, getting late here and I'm on the East coast of uh, uh, the States and uh, it's a, on a Friday evening. So it uh, may be uh, time for that. So uh, that's, that's one of those loaded questions uh, and uh, time for another discussion. Yeah, no problem. And uh, so, uh, and I respect that completely. I understand that a beer is in order. Next time I see you, we'll get a beer. And we'll have that discussion. Um, but nevertheless, uh, I really appreciate your time with me. And I want to ask you if there's anything else you'd like to add uh, before we terminate the uh, podcast. Uh, let's see. We didn't talk about digital transformation, which is uh, uh, one of the underlying elements here. So uh, in, in any depth. But again, just to reiterate that this isn't just about translation and interpreting, uh, but it's instead about the uh, an, an entire array of capabilities that uh, come with this, uh, let's call it a, uh, this power of, of AI coming in has opened up uh, some technologies that previously were closed and opened yep. up the eyes of a lot of people to what uh, they could be doing instead of this, this narrow uh, set of services, but instead they could become much more important to the organizations that they intend to serve. And so the important thing here is, uh, I think it was Warren Buffett talks about uh, building uh, moats for competition. Uh, you need a moat around you that uh, defines your value proposition, that your strengths, your capabilities. 
And so yeah. uh, whether we're talking about a uh, an LSP or a technology vendor or uh, somebody buying their services, at the end of the day, the important thing is they need that dis differentiation, that distinct value proposition. And that's the challenge, especially more so now than ever, to say that uh, it's not just I'm competing against other companies, I'm competing against a fundamental shift in how uh, these these functions are delivered. I guess most of the companies, you know, on digital transformation, they're stuck in the, you know, I sell localization kind of a deal. And uh, to approach another service, most companies have a hard time approaching another service, but because bringing another service requires to build a relationship with, build bridges within another buyer. And that buyer, not necessarily the one that you're familiar with, that buys from you translation all the time. And uh, there is a chicken and the egg kind of a conversation going on in there. You know, is this something you're just starting? How much experience do you have in it? Uh, validating that you can do it appropriately and effectively and who you're competing with against uh, at, at the same time for those services, right? Exactly. So there are some challenges in there, but you bring a very good point because adding services to existing and capitalizing on the trust that you currently have with your market, it's much easier than going outside and building a new company and starting a brand new business altogether. Right. This simple thing would be, I'm doing translation. I want to do trans creation. If I have credibility Correct. with my clients for doing translation into a number of languages, could I do the same thing with this other set of services? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. Don, always pleasure talking to you. I really appreciate it. Um, and I want to thank you for uh, joining my uh, podcast today, joining me on this journey. Um, and, and I know, um, I hope it won't be the last one. I hope we can get you back on the show here um, more often. I'd love to hear from you, get an update from you every once in a while, what's going on in the world of uh, our world that is changing rapidly. And uh, we hardly can keep up with the changes that are coming. Oh, absolutely. So. so thank you so much, Don. If there's any, uh, any other comments uh, from your side before we uh, terminate the recording. No, thank you. It's no, I really appreciate it, Don. Thanks for joining me and for our audience. Thank you for listening in. Uh, for those who are watching on YouTube, thanks for joining me. If you don't mind, if you like what we uh, do on this channel, please like and subscribe and comment on our content. If you have any ideas of uh, what you like to hear or topics that you like to for us to discuss on this channel, please share with me. I really appreciate it as well. So thanks for everybody. Enjoy the uh, weekend and uh, we'll talk to you next episode. Appreciate it.